first time I went on a date with Lizzie, I don't remember it very well. I'm not sure why that is. And we argue which is the first date and the second date. The second date, I think I've told you, I took her to my farm. I took her for a ride on my tractor. Pretty much that was an invitation to get married. Because <laughs> I don't let anybody on that red tractor of mine, let me tell you. I remember we were driving along. I said, Lizzie, you better hold on. This thing's pretty fast. <laughs> she reaches along and grabs hold of me as we thundered along at five kilometres an hour. <laughs> But I pretty much knew that I loved this girl because I really enjoyed spending time with her. And when I'm with my wife, I get a sense of warmth, of safety and acceptance. And she brought joy and she's brought sunshine into my life. And today's a special day for me because 14 years ago I've got a little girl sitting here in the front who was born today. And this time 14 years ago, Danae and I together were in a room because she was born by C-section. Mum had to go and get tidied up. And here's Danae and me in the room for two hours in this little windowless room, just this little baby and me. It's two of the best hours I've had in my entire life. And Danae, it's been a joy to have you around too because you give me love and joy and happiness. And you're 14 today and I wish you a happy birthday. I hope you have many more and I hope they just get happier and happier. You see, when we are with people we love, it does something to us. Amen? And it's the same with Jesus. If ever there was a time where you and I, where Christians need to be in the presence of Jesus, it's today. Never has the world been so hostile to human beings and to life as it is today. I purposefully did this and I held off in the preparation of this section of my sermon until yesterday afternoon. And I looked through the papers. I want to just give you a touch of how hostile it is becoming to live on the planet today for human beings. In fact, the planet is almost anti-human being. Uh, here, were the, here were the headlines. Now, we're Seventh-day Adventists. We hear preachers and evangelists get up the front and preach about the headlines and the depravity and the wickedness and the evil of the world all the time, but I think sometimes we need to stop. And we need to seriously look at what is happening in our world. This is yesterday afternoon, Friday, 4th of December, 2015. Here they are. Apocalyptic floods in India. Mass murder attack in the United States. And we all know this week how 14 people, innocent people, were shot down in cold blood by a young people, by, by, by a young couple. And if you were looking at them, you'd say they're a normal, happy young couple walking in with automatic assault rifles. And shooting dead 14 people. And when we see this, when we witness this, even if we see it on the news, it's impacting us. It's hurting us too. And it's taking little bits of flesh out of us and wounding us and damaging us. The world is an inhospitable place for human life. Civil war in Syria. Aussie surfers murdered in Mexico. And... I just could keep going listing all the bad news in the newspaper that I read online yesterday afternoon. In fact, I was talking to my dad the other day. I said, I'm glad Liska's taken... Liska took the TV out of our house. I don't know what I'm going to do if the cricket season on us, but it's gone. In some ways, I'm glad it's gone because I don't have to watch the news every night. Do you know what I'm saying? All that bad news being beamed into our homes. I'm not telling you not to watch it, but I'm just letting you know today it's having an impact on your mind, on your heart, on your well-being. And we see it 
in the community. We see it in our own lives and we see it in the lives of our families and our friends. We see it in the lives of the Australian community. People in enormous record numbers are suffering from depression and mental illness. Suicide is on the up because life has become so inhospitable on the planet. Sometimes, I kind of shared a bit of this with you before, I like to watch people and if I'm catching the train into town for some reason, I'll sit at the station and I'll watch people and I particularly like to look at the expression on their faces. And you know what I see when I'm at the train station or at the airport? You know, at the airport's a good place to watch people because sometimes you can be waiting for hours for a plane. You know what I see? I see people bent over with fear and anxiety and a good part of depression. You can actually see it on the faces of the people. And I think sometimes it's reflected even in the people of the church, the people who share Jesus, the people who have Jesus, who worship Jesus. And I'm here to say today that it doesn't have to be because just as I enjoy being with Liska and Danae and my family and my dad and my mum and just as I enjoy coming here to New Hope with you people who are also part of my family and I'm part of yours now and it brings me joy and happiness so being with Jesus does that for you too amen it really does And it's a cliche thing to say, but really, Seventh-day Adventists should be the happiest people in the world. Because they have Jesus. But our world is suffering depression, mental illness, suicides on the up. And yet you look at uh, uh, at the world we actually live in here in Australia, never have we been so wealthy. Never have we been so well educated. Never have we lived longer. Never have we eaten, well, some of us, better. And and if you don't think we eat well, well, you better stay for the fellowship lunch here at New Hope after this Bible study. Never had we had more holidays. Never have we been healthier. And yet never have we been so unhappy. And it's a sad thing. And yet at the opposite, I've got a friend in England. She's studying at Newbold College. She... I think she caught a train just the other day across the channel to France to where all these refugees are gathered at the Channel Tunnel camped trying to get into England. And she wrote this and it really, I guess, stopped me in my tracks because I guess, I don't know, Lizzie, can I be as good a complainer and whinger as any? (laughs) I know what it's like to suffer depression. I've suffered mental illness. I've been there. I know what it's like to walk in the darkness and to get so far down you can't get up. And here is what she wrote on her Facebook page. And it's about an Iraqi refugee family camped in a tent in the increasing cold of a French winter. She wrote, this is the the definition of generosity. I'm reading word for word. This family, so she's there giving out food for Adra in this camp. She's a student at Newbold College. She's a friend of mine, one of my first Bible studies on the Gold Coast 25 years ago. She says, this family, refugees from Iraq, did not line up to receive the free hot food and fresh fruit from the various charity organisations yesterday, even at the direct invitation from a member of ADRA France. Kind of makes me proud that ADRA's there, you know. Instead, they invited us to share their simple meal of rice and beans cooked over this stove. And when we refused, they then offered us tea. The husband has shrapnel wounds on his back from a bomb blast and his hands are severely deformed as the bones were broken and not treated properly afterwards. He has abscessed teeth and not... (laughs) He has abscessed teeth and is in pain when he eats. Listen to this. Yet his warm smile and the sparkle in the beautiful eyes of his youngest son, which he had a picture of, will teach you what it means to be a grateful human being. God bless these people 
and use us to supply their urgent needs. What is wrong with us? What is wrong with our culture? What is wrong with our country? Why are we so unhappy? You know, the Bible has a secret that not many Christians know. It's a big secret, but it doesn't take long to share. It's something in the last year that I've been preaching in this church, I've shared with you little bits of it, but now I want to concentrate on it for just a few moments. It is an important secret. The whole world needs to know this secret, and I am appealing to you, the people of New Hope, the children of God, Seventh-day Adventists here in Schofields, I'm appealing to you to embrace this secret in your life, because if you do, you will walk out of here happy. You will walk out of here appreciative. And you will walk out of here, and this is the most important thing, you will walk out of here in peace. And you know what that secret is? You know what it is? Well, yeah, it is Jesus, but it's... Grace. Grace. All these things are right. It's rest. You might think that's a bit strange, but the secret is Rest. All these people in Australia who are so blessed in the temporal things of the world, who have cars and houses and holidays, who most have money, you say, well, I've got a lot. Look, if you slept in a warm bed last night under a roof, you're better off than most people on the planet. Most of these people in Australia, the problem is that they, it's not that they don't have the things they need to live life successfully. We do, hallelujah. We live, I believe, in the greatest country in the world. And that's not just false boasting from an Australian. I have traveled. I have seen how other people live. We, and I don't know why it is, but we are blessed. Blessed, blessed, blessed beyond any other nation in the world. We have natural resources. We live in peace. We have a beautiful country. Really, if you want to, you can get a job. It might be a low-paying one, but you can get it. This is a fabulous country, but the thing that Australians and many, many Seventh-day Adventists, many Christians don't have is rest. We are sleep deprived. And I'm not talking about going home, Desiree, and having a sleep in your bed this afternoon. (laughs) I'm talking about spiritual rest. This world has no spiritual rest. And the only way you can have spiritual rest is to be in the presence of Jesus Christ, of God. That's how you get it. Go into his presence. And it must frustrate the Lord, I think. Up there in the heavens, the Holy Spirit here on earth, when this rest is being offered to us, And so many human beings don't take it. And if you want to look at the world and why it's going to unravel at the end of time, it's because people are so spiritually rest-deprived that they lose their minds. Do you hear what I'm saying? And we need to be a people of rest. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. Jesus said, beautiful scripture, Come to me. This is his call to New Hope Australia and the entire world. This is what Jesus offers that no atheist, no evolutionist, no non-believer in Jesus Christ and God can ever have. Now, there are fakes out there. There is fake rest. There is fake peace. But you can't have this without Jesus. And when you've got this, it doesn't matter what happens to you. You're going to be okay because you're in rest. The whole world can descend in chaos around your head. Your whole life can fall apart. But you have Jesus and you have rest. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened. I'll give you rest. But how did he get it? He said, come to me. Come to me, said Jesus. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke 
upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle of heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light and I know that as a testimony. I know that that's what it's like serving and following and walking with Jesus because I'm experiencing it. I'm not sharing something with you this morning that I haven't got myself. It is beautiful, something very beautiful to have rest in Jesus. Now, what do I mean by rest? I want to give you a definition up on the screen. It is the sense of security and peace. Did you hear that? This is what comes from Jesus. It is a sense of security and peace that flows from a right relation with God through faith. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Through obedience, I'm going to talk about that, to God and membership in his kingdom. It's this sense of security and peace. So when everybody gets all tied up about the threat of terrorism, do we? Do we? Because we've got security and peace because we're with Jesus, our big brother who made the world. It looks like it's out of control. We know it's not because we're with Jesus and he gives us security and he gives us peace. Do you get this? Do you get it? But you can only have it if you're with Jesus. Uh, Go to Hebrews chapter 4. I just want to Use a few verses here. Verse 1. If you've got your Bibles open, don't rely on the screen. That's for the TV viewers who might not have a Bible. Hebrews 4 verse 1. Now remember, I talked about Lizka and Danae and the joy they give me. I actually even get a little bit of peace. Well, (laughs) sometimes I get some peace from Lizka. Uh, It depends what's going down in the house. Uh, it's been an interesting experience being married again after eight years. But uh, look, truly, I, I, I can't tell you the joy it is to have family. And you know what I'm talking about. That same joy, only it's magnified hugely. It's security and peace you have if you have Jesus. There's a lot of anxiety out there. People are worried about a lot of things. Job security financial security? Is my marriage going to survive? A terrorist going to get into Australia and blow us up? We're also worried about all these different things. And Jesus is there and saying, what are you worrying about? I'm here. Come to me. I'm going to put my arms around you. You'll have security and peace. Now look at this. Hebrews 4 verse 1. This is God talking to you at New Hope this morning. This is end time Bible study now. And it's It's Bible study. We're in the Bible, where we should be as a people. God's promise of entering his rest still stands. It's there. It still stands. The promise, the offer to you today still stands. And then the author of Hebrews, Paul, I believe it's Paul, says, so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you, that some of us might fail to experience it. And if you're not experiencing the rest that God offers today, you know what I'm talking about. And perhaps you are trembling with fear. You've got that gap in your heart. You've got that longing. You're reaching out. You're trying to find completion. You're trying to find peace. You buy a house for a little while, you feel good. And then that disquiet, that anxiety comes back again. So you go and buy a new car and you feel better again, but it doesn't take long. The thing's got to go and get fixed up or it gets a scratch on it or they bring a new model out and you feel that disquiet and that anxiety like you just haven't made it. So you go and upgrade your job or you go on a holiday or you upgrade your husband or your wife. It's happening all the time. Because you're looking for completion. You're looking for fulfillment. If only I could have just a little bit more, I'll be okay. But there are billionaires out there that are a testimony to the fact that no matter how much you search, unless you have Jesus, you will not experience it. And I would rather have Jesus, and I would rather have the peace and the security that he's brought to me than be a billionaire like Packer or Murdoch. I would not, and I'm telling you, I would not 
trade places with them in a moment if I had to give away the peace and the security that Jesus has given me. I would not do it. You cannot buy it. It is more valuable than anything you will ever get your hands on, and yet you can't, you can't give it to yourself. It's got to come from Jesus. And I can be anxious, and I can be troubled, and I can be going through difficult times, and I open my Bible, and I'm on my knees. I don't get on my knees a lot and pray because my knee's done. I'm on my bed praying. I'm in my car praying. Look, there are times... Satan will attack me a lot on Fridays just before Sabbath. And I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I belong to you. You promise me security and peace. The Holy Spirit washes the peace of God. Right you know what I'm talking about? Have you experienced it? Amen. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And Jesus says in verse 1, it's available, but be afraid in case you miss it. Verse 2, for this good news that God has prepared this rest, he made it, has been announced to us just as it was to them. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Hebrews in the Old Testament. He's saying, God offered them peace too. The same thing, he offered it to them. He offered them rest. He offered them the security. But the Bible says, For the good news that the God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them, but it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. Rest only comes through faith. And I've, I've talked to you a lot about that this year, faith. How faith is increased by exercise, or in, in other words, by experiencing it. Um, Jesus' disciples were, a storm, were in a storm in a boat. Jesus came along, gets in the boat and calms the storm. They are receiving faith. They're exercising, they're getting faith. Lazarus is risen from the dead, the disciples see it. They are exercising, they are experiencing faith. It's growing because they're seeing Jesus in action. They see all his miracles, their faith increases. Then they see Jesus resurrected from the dead. No wonder these men were so strong in the Lord and went, all of them, 11 of the 12 went to their deaths, martyrs' death. John's the only one who died a natural death. They went there because they had seen Jesus, they had been with Jesus, they had experienced rest. Paul the Apostle comes along a little later. This man lives a troubled life, but just before he dies in his prison cell, he writes, I know whom I have believed. And what does he say? I am persuaded that he is able to keep me unto that day. Look, Paul was a man of faith because he had exercised his faith. You are at New Hope. You've had a chance to see the miracles of God this year. Amen? Amen. You've seen it with your own eyes. There's reason for you to be developing faith because you've seen it in your church. God at work. God in you, hope, is not dead. He's alive. He's leading us. And you need to look at what the Lord is doing in you, hope, and you need to say, yes, Lord, I believe. And when you believe, you get rest. Sometimes I have to say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. But we need to be practicing our faith. When bad things come along, I preached a whole sermon on it. Don't curse God. Don't remonstrate with him. Don't get angry no matter what happens. Say, Lord, I'm hurt and I'm in pain. I'm damaged. But I believe. Do you know what it's like to have rest in the worst of storms? I have seen, I think, the worst thing that could ever happen to a parent is to lose a child. I have seen fathers and mothers lose young children. Tragedies. And yet you know what? I have seen them go through that experience, weeping, the tragedy, the horrors upon them, but I've seen them go through that experience in rest because they have faith in Jesus, they believe in him, and even in the worst circumstances, he's with them. They got rest. They've got security. 
Verse 3. For only we who believe can enter his rest. As for the others, God said, in my anger I took an oath. They'll never enter my place of rest, even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. See, in verse 3, he's reinforcing you can only have this rest through faith. I remember an old lady at Warunga, not long after I started. She was in her 90s. She's one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. I told her, Lizga, that if she was 60 years younger, I would have married her. She was just this most beautiful person. She got sick. She loved the Lord. And she, you know, I walked into her home to visit her the first time. And as I walked into her home, it was like I walked into a peaceful haven of rest. Have you ever done that? People who really are in rest, they kind of walk around with this rest following them. You know what I mean? They come across, oh, how are you, Desiree? And Desiree's had a terrible week and, and things are not going good. And she feels the rest that, you, you know what I'm talking about? The rest goes with them. And, and I walked into a house, beautiful. And she was such a lovely, I, I've not met a much more holy person in my life. You know, she got sick and she had to have dialysis. And it was very difficult because she's in her 90s and you get old, your, your skin apparently gets thin. And, and they try to put the needles in and they have a lot of... One day she comes to me and she says, Pastor, she says, I love the Lord so much. But she says, I don't want to do this dialysis anymore. And she showed me a, her arm and it had pocket marks all over it. And she said... Uh, do you think the Lord would mind if I stopped doing dialysis? What would you say? <laughs> Lord doesn't mind. You do whatever the Lord leads you to do. I said, are you okay? She said, she didn't use the word rest. She said, I'm at peace. I know Jesus. And I know that I'll go to sleep. When I wake up, I'll see him. You know, she stopped having dialysis within five days. She went to sleep and passed away. But I saw that lady die with rest. Then I go to visit another man, church member, good and regular standing, had come to church all his life. He'd been a really hard worker for the church. I sat by his bed and he's dying. Adventist man. And this was after this other lady had passed away. And this new guy I'm talking to, he's dying, he knows it, and he's horrified. He's scared. He's afraid. And he grabbed my hand so tight. And I could see the fear in his eyes, and no matter what I said to him, he couldn't settle. And he died in horror because he had no rest. Do, do you get what I'm saying? Even when it comes to your death, if you have faith and you believe, if you're spending time with God in Bible study and prayer every day, if you're coming to Sabbath school and to church, if you're, in, if you're taking every chance you can to be in the presence of God, and if you're saying, Lord, I'm here and I need that rest, he'll give it to you and he'll give it to you until the day you die. And if he doesn't come one day, you die too. And you can die good or you can die bad. I intend to die in rest. Amen? So let's finish this. Verse 4. We know it is already because... We know it is ready because of the place in the scripture where it mentions the seventh day. On the seventh day, God rested from his work. The Sabbath is an example of this rest. I've talked to you about how I come to church and if Claire's not here, I could do the Sabbath school and the church service and an afternoon program. I went and did a, a series once and I was doing five to six programs a day. It's amazing on the Sabbath, after the end of the Sabbath, the Sabbath's often a hard day for me, how I, I go home and I've said it to you, haven't I, Lizzie? I feel, do you know what I say? Rested. I'm not talking about physical, I'm talking about spiritual. I feel at peace. I'm, re I'm revived from being here at church. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm at rest. You know, I want to close now. I encourage you to go and read Hebrews chapter 4. Study the whole lot. Goes through to about verse 11. But I want to read verse 7 to you. Because it's an appeal right in the middle of this study. And it says this. 
And by the way, with the Sabbath, I just want to stop for a second. I want to talk to you about the Sabbath just a bit more for a second. What you have on the Sabbath, you can have every day all the time. Amen? Amen. True? We get a big dose of it on the Sabbath, and that's how God designs it. That's why the Sabbath's so beautiful. People say to me, why do you keep the Sabbath? And I hear a lot of Adventists say, well, I keep the Sabbath. Because if I don't, I'll have the mark of the beast. Have you heard that? <laughs> or I keep the Sabbath. Because it's a part of the Ten Commandments. It's the law of God, and we're to obey Him. Mm-hmm. But I say I keep the Sabbath because I get into the presence of Jesus and I experience rest. Do you hear what I'm saying? And those people out there in our community, they need the Sabbath because they're rest, sleep deprived. Now verse 7, let's look at it and let's stop because I've gone over time. So God set another time for entering his rest. And that time, so he gives the example of the Sabbath and he says, and God set another time for entering his, Sabbath, his rest, not just the Sabbath. And that time is today. God announced this through David much later in the world's already quoted. Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hair, hair hearts. And, and, and there's the appeal. Now, today as I close, some of you are experiencing great troubles. Some of you aren't, but I want to tell you something. We are all headed into a time of trouble. Daniel 12, 1, like the Bible says, has never happened before. Your eyes are going to see things shortly that you never thought, you could never imagine your eyes would see. You're going to need to go into that time of trouble with rest. I'll finish with a story. There was a woman by the name of Marie Duran. She's a French woman. She lived hundreds of years ago. In the middle of the Protestant Reformation, this great contest between the Church of Rome and Protestantism. She's 17 years old. She's engaged to a young pastor. He was about 20. They were arrested by the authorities because they were Huguenots, Protestants. And the church arrests them. She's 17 years old. She knew what it was like And she had experienced rest in Jesus. And once you've had rest in Jesus, the very thing Satan doesn't want you to have, Satan will do anything to try and rip it away from you. She's in rest. She's in a real experience with Jesus. She's born again. She's converted. This is a woman. You look at her life. She spends every chance she can to be in the presence of Jesus. And so too should we. She goes into a time of trouble. She's arrested. We are facing the same sort of trouble, brothers and sisters. She's arrested. She's put on trial. A priest comes to talk to her. Hey, and she was arrested the weekend before her marriage. The priest comes to her and says, hey, look, We've arrested your fiancé. We've arrested you. Deny this God that you serve. Worship our God and I will set you free. But she had experienced the rest, the joy, the peace, the delight it is to have Jesus in your life. And when you've truly experienced that, nothing, (coughs) nothing can drag you away from it. She said, I can't do it. Do you know that on the day of her marriage, the priest comes to you and says, look, your your fiancé has turned. He has come back to the mother church. He is there ready to marry you. Deny this false God that you claim. Now imagine a 17-year-old girl in love. She's, she's put in a tower. I, I walked into that tower, freezing cold in the winter and boiling hot in the summer. She's put in this tower. She's put in a cell. And she says, even though my fiancé deny my Lord, I will not. Because she had experienced God. Now, did her fiancé deny the Lord or not? I don't know the story. Never really. We don't know. But she did not, and for every day, every day, for 36 years, a priest would come into her cell and ask her to deny her God and to follow his, to leave her church, the movement, the Protestant movement, that that advances this story of rest, and to come back to the mother church, and every single day she resisted the call. 
She's my age, 52, 53. When she finally gets out, they let her go, they gave up. She gets out, she goes home, she's dead in weeks. And that was her life. And I walked up into that tower where she had been in prison and I walked into her cell and I looked down on the stone floor <coughs> and there Marie Durand had scratched into the stone resistus French for resistance she was resisting for her Lord and she stayed true and she stayed loyal and she stayed faithful because in those 36 odd years she had in prison, she was not alone. She was with the Lord. And they were hard years, they were difficult years, they were trying on her. She left in broken health, she was dead within weeks of leaving the cell. Most would look at her life and say, what a waste. But she spent her life, though she'd be in a prison cell, in rest with Jesus Christ. And no matter what Satan tried to do to rip her away from it, she would not give him up. And we are going into the same time of trouble. You don't hear it preached all that much, but we're going there. And we need to have the experience that Marie Durand had. It's an experience of conversion. She was born again. And Jesus gifted her with rest, with peace, and with security. And I just want you to bow your heads for a moment as I pray. And I want to make a little call. I'm not going to make an altar call, just a little call. If you're not, and, and the television cameras will not be on you, so no one will see this, just you and God. If you're not experiencing this rest today, and you'd like to, or if you are experiencing this rest and you want to keep it, so this is for two lots of people, should be all of us in the church. If you're not experiencing this rest and you would like it, and you want to ask God now, that's the first group. Or if you are experiencing it and you want to keep it, no one's looking, I just want you to raise your hand. And I want you to keep it up. I'm not looking, no one's looking, just God and you. And I want to pray with, keep your hand up, mine's up because I want to keep it. I want to pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you today in this troubled world. There are disasters everywhere. Terrorism, the world's going broke, civil wars, diseases running rampant. Father, there's physical disasters all over the place, floods like we've never seen, earthquakes, tsunamis, things I'd never seen with my eyes, I've already seen, Lord. There's a lot of reason for us to have no security and to be anxious. But Lord, you can see the hands of those who have raised them into the air. Lord, we want that peace. That's why we've got our hands in the air. Put your hands up if you want it. Lord, we want that peace. We want that security. Bless us with it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite our music team forward. We're going to sing a, a song to finish.
I share these messages with you because I truly think we're going to see the world plunge into terrible chaos and darkness. And I want you at New Hope, above all people, to go into it in peace. Do you hear me? I, I want you to have rest, but not as much as Jesus does. Why should you worry or fear? You have Jesus. And so I, I close, and I I've gone over time, I know it, I close, but I appeal to you, go to Jesus. Find your rest in him. If you're not studying the Bible, start studying it every day. If you're not in prayer, start talking to the Lord. One person I read, they said it, it can take a lot of steps to get away from the Lord, but it only takes one step to come home. I want you, and Jesus wants you, to go through what is ahead of us in peace, in rest. And if you can do that, yeah, it's going to be a hard time, but you're going to walk through it successfully because you're in rest with Jesus. I wish it upon you. Above all else that I wish you, I wish you the rest of Christ. Let's pray. I'll bless you, Lord. We worship you in your holy name. And now as we close, I pray that you'll go with these people. I pray that they will be a people of peace, and rest and I pray Lord as our families and our friends and our neighbours see the peace and the rest that you've given us that they too will long for the same thing and that they too will be drawn to seek the Jesus that we serve O oh Lord in the name of Jesus of Nazareth may that be the experience of every person in this church today I pray in your name Amen My name's Lloyd Grollin and I'm the Aussie Pastor and it's our program you've been watching. I hope you enjoyed it. But more than that, I hope you got a little glimpse of Jesus. Now these programs, as you can imagine, they cost a whole lot of money to put together. And if you'd like to join with us to partner, we'd really appreciate that. You can just go online. It's all online. You can donate there. We'd appreciate it. And you know what? If you're ever in Northwest Sydney, why don't you come to New Hope and meet me personally? I would love that. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you.